Beechworth has an enormously rich history because of a number of factors. The gold story, the, the history of the gold rush, was extraordinary in northeast Victoria and it was focused around this area of Beechworth. Then there are some really famous people that have come and lived in Beechworth at different times. So Isaac Isaacs, who was Australia's first Australian-born Governor-General, went to school in Beechworth. Sir Redmond Barry worked here as a judge. He was the man that committed or sentenced Ned to death. But he's famous for a whole lot of other reasons. There was a great scientist called Dame Jean McNamara who did some incredible work on releasing the myxomatosis virus which was to stop the spread of rabbits in Australia. And she's also famous for her work that she did with victims of polio, helping them with that. And then we have the asylum. Basically what it was, it was built in 1867, they uh, had it there to put people in who didn't fit into the general law or lawless category, because you had people there for lots of reasons. Uh, if you like reading novels, they'd shove you in there. Um, there were such things as uh, acquired brain injury where they were hit in the head during an accident or kicked by a horse or something. Um, there were women put in here for being abandoned by their husbands. There were single mothers put in here and there were prostitutes put in here. There were people with all sorts of diseases, people who couldn't speak English were put in the asylum. Falling in love is a good one. Drinking too much, working too hard. There were all sorts of manner of people up there for whatever reason. In the early days, what went on in there is, well, they had some weird and wonderful things. They had water treatment when they bought in electricity. There was no drugs before 18, 1950s. So they used water treatments, they used um, isolation, they used all sorts of weird and wonderful things to bring people back to normality. We would assume that there is a, a usage of uh, lobotomy here because that was quite popular throughout the time this facility was opened. It was considered a cutting edge treatment for certain manias, manias where the people were dangerous to themselves or others. And before that, there was hydrotherapies and restraints. The restraining was their only real option when we first opened, with straight jackets and being tied to the beds. There's a few patients in particular that went to the asylum. Jill, who was here in the 1950s, she was only uh, 14 when they put her in here, and she died at 16. And uh, Fred would be another one. He was a returned soldier killed his uh, stepmother in the middle of a hallucination and spent 63 years here being treated as a criminal and patient. And one particular patient that stood out was James Kelly, who was Ned Kelly's uncle. He was put in here for continually lighting fires. As far as we can find, he actually set fire to the Kelly farmstead at one point when Ned was just a teenager. Um, he was kept over in Olivine, which was the the ward for the criminally insane, so he was considered quite dangerous. Um, there were quite a few guys that, that we know of that were in there. Um, there was another tall gentleman by the name of Ted, or Theodore, who was put in here, as far as we can tell, for slicing his barber's throat when he didn't like a haircut that he was given. Um, Ted does tend to be quite active at times. He's been known to spin the, the exhaust fan on request at times and a very, very large six, six and a half foot shape has been seen a number of times by tour groups and tour guides over the years. 
Some of the past staff that work here that we are aware of, um, especially over in the ladies' side in the, the women's ward, uh, there is a, a nurse, Kate Kavanagh. Uh, there's also the matron, Matron Sharp, who worked here in the early 1900s, we believe. Um, she was quite renowned for bringing in new therapies, uh, pet, pets as therapy, art therapies, music, and she also brought proper clothes for the patients. Well, the sewing room was used, of course, by the seamstress. She was a paid employee. She had patients working with her when she was up there as well. They were making the nursing uniforms, patient uniforms, costumes for plays, um, theatrical shows, things like that. All the bedding and linen that was required here. And they also did any mending that was required. Uh, she retired due to ill health and died in Berrigan a few years later but she has been seen here walking the halls and the grounds outside numerous times over the years. Um, the most memorable experience here for me has been probably seeing the full body apparition of the matron walk past to the point where I actually asked um, a staff member at the time running to us who, who's in that costume tonight and she went, what are you, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, the woman outside in white. And she went, there's no woman in white and I described what I saw and she goes, oh, that's the matron sharp. Um, and I'd never really seen a full-bodied apparition here before, so that was probably my most memorable. Um, other than that, uh, the fan spinning in the ceiling um, and then stopping and starting on command is pretty, pretty memorable. Three times in one night I saw a full-body apparition. I was walking over to unlock the toy shop area for the tour and I saw a tall gentleman dressed all in black in a waistcoat and a top hat standing underneath a tree for a second, then he disappeared. Then I was back over, I walked from unlocking the toy store to relock the matron's area stairs where the tourists first go in. And I locked and turned and he was standing 30 feet away from me at the junction at the corner of the building, just looking at me. I could see him clearly, except for his face that was fully in shadow. I could see the, the lights glinting off the brass of his waistcoat buttons. I have seen full-on apparitions. Um, I've also seen so transparent, and I have seen the shadows as well. There's shadow men down in Olivine and Gravillia that we do see quite a bit. I've heard um, down in Gravillia a child spirit. You can hear the little boy <laughs> giggling, and then you hear the little footsteps. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's always fun. <laughs> the first time we heard that sort of freaked us out because after you heard the running, he slammed the door. So that was interesting. There's another, pa another where well, we think it's a patient, is often picked up by people in the corridor. Often as people are standing with their backs to the corridor while we're talking about the morgue table and they feel something behind them or hear something behind them. And when they turn around to look, quite often the figure is seen at the end of the corridor. I know the image that you're talking of. It was taken by Haunting Australia when they were here, not to do an episode of their show, but just purely to do an investigation. I was in the room on the night it was taken. Um, the photo was taken by a, ma a man by the name of Garav, who is actually one of India's top paranormal investigators. Yeah, so that's a little girl squatting down. That was in the Gravillia building. And it was at the end of the room where the fridge still is. There has been reports of a young girl seen over there. And I myself had an experience there in a straitjacket when I was locked in there by myself, where I heard a child's footsteps walking towards me and a young girl giggling. So that does correspond with that same, from the same area as the photograph. Well, we've sort of had um, different kinds from full body apparitions, footsteps, doors banging, um, unexplained voices, unexplained lights. Um, objects being drained very quickly, like your equipment, that sort of thing, batteries go quick. Um, people bursting into tears for no reason, people feeling sick and dry reaching, basically having to run out of buildings, feeling like they're having heart attacks, that sort of thing happens quite a bit. If the, the spirits are feeling particularly answerable, uh, there have been noises, there have been lots of scratches. We've had a, a few patrons scratched over the last three months, mostly down in the cellar. There was one group, family group, there was about eight of them, and the middle boy, I think he was about 17, 18, was leaning back into a corner in the 
cellar and a guy had noticed that he was holding his hand out and sort of jerking it funny and she said, What's, is there something wrong? And he said, something's got my hand and is trying to pull me back into the corner. Then he ripped his hand forward and flinched and arched his back at the same time. When they got him up here, they lifted his shirt and found three gouges right down each side of his spine, starting from his shoulder blades down. And there was no one in the corner behind him, that's for sure. There are some parts of the asylum I won't go into. There is a furnace room over again on the women's side, and it just seems really, really menacing. Very, very menacing. It, it's partially sub-level. It goes down about five feet into the ground, and there's a big furnace there. And I don't know what they were burning there back in the day, but it just seems very dark and, and ominous. I hate that area. And the window, the glass window on the door, more often than not, it was all fogged up as though there's something inside there breathing. That maniac award. I'm not, o not overly keen in walking through there on my own at night. Daytime, I don't mind it. Yes, there's been a few visits up there. Um, the most common one is a, there's a hole in the wall at the end and there's a female, very scruffy blonde hair, white gown. She's often seen through the hole. She's looking back at the person that has seen her. <laughs> Every night you take equipment out, um, even during the day, you constantly get um, contact, so it's very active. We have regular contact with, and I tend to go out once a week and do what I call a live feed on Facebook, and I take a couple of pieces out by myself to some of the more haunted areas, and over in the women's ward, in admin, I've had a number of conversations with one or two entities over there, a lady named Beverly, who was actually really responsive with a couple of different pieces of equipment that were showing quite regular intelligent yes and no answers on two pieces of equipment at the same time. I think in terms of not taking things seriously, being on the fence, that sort of thing, our personal opinion as investigators is um, it's fine if you're a sceptic, but generally when you have an experience that you can't rationalise, that's when you start to, to change your mindset a little bit. So until you have that experience, you know, we respect that not everyone's going to be a believer. You just don't have logic for it. You just sort of start going, OK, well, actually, maybe there's more to this paranormal stuff than I first thought. Yeah, it's, it's definitely noticeable when you're up here during the daytime um, and then the sun starts to go down, everything starts to shift and you can feel the atmosphere shift. <laughs>